A woman goes missing, and five days later, the primary suspect in her disappearance ends up dead. The question remains, though, was it an accident, was it murder, or did he do it to himself? Hello, True Crimeers. This is the case of Tina Marcott, who viewer discretion is advised. This case occurred in 1994 in Rapid City, South Dakota. 29-year-old Tom Keeter was married, his wife's name was Nancy, and they had two children together. On June 28th, 1994, at the lumber yard that Tom Keeter worked at, which was called Forest Products Distributors, uh, Tom worked as a forklift driver there. Well, on that June 28th, 1994 day, a couple of his co-workers found Tom underneath his own forklift. His head had been crushed underneath one of the rear wheels of the forklift. Tom was lying on his stomach, and he was very obviously deceased. Now, initially, uh, OSHA would come in to investigate this, and they investigated it as a workplace incident or accident. But when the police also got involved, they disagreed with OSHA, saying that this was not an accident, that this man, Tom Keeter, probably did this to himself. Why? He was wrapped up in an investigation of a missing woman. The forklift that Tom was found underneath had just thousands of pounds of lumber stacked on it, more than they would usually put on a forklift. And it was set at an incline. So what they think happened was that Tom deliberately set this up. Then he uh, turned everything on, began and I guess made it move forward, then jumped out of the cab laid down on the ground in front of it and waited for it to run over him and crush him. Which, I mean, is an excruciating way to end your own life. I mean, that is not a way most people would think of doing because that was going to be slow and very painful. However, the belief is that he may have done it that way to make it look like a workplace incident so that his family, his wife and two kids, could get a high insurance payout. But why do police believe this was something he did to himself? So five days earlier, a woman named Tina Marcotte vanished. Tina, originally from Manchester, New Hampshire, she was 30 years old at the time of this case. Her and Tom Keeter actually used to be co-workers. They were acquaintances. Her and Tom used to work together at the place that Tina currently worked at, which was a company called Black Hills Molding. On June 24th, 1994, Tina was working a late shift. When she walks out to her car to go home, she notices that one of her tires is flat. So she goes back inside and she picks up the phone and she calls a very good friend of hers named Vicky. She explains to Vicky, I walked out, my car, you know, my tire was flat. I don't know what to do. Vicky said, don't worry about it, even though it's, you know, past midnight, it's like around 12.30 in the morning. Uh, she said she'll get up and she will get ready and go pick her up and bring her home. And so as she's saying that, Tina interrupts her and says, well, actually, hold on a second, Vicky. I see somebody pulling up and a car pulls up to the front of the business where Tina is calling from. And she walks away from the phone and like two or three minutes later, she comes back to the phone and tells Vicky, never mind, Vicky, I'm good. I have a ride home. Tom is here and he's gonna take me home. And Vicky said, Tom, Tom who? Tina would respond, oh, Tom, he used to work with me here. So Vicky said, okay, great, goodbye. Um, I'm, I'm going back to bed, <laughs> I'll talk to you later. However, later would never come because from that moment, nobody ever heard from Tina ever again. Tina's live-in boyfriend, uh, they had been dating for about 11 or 12 years. His name was Patrick Gleason. The two of them, he and Tina, actually had three kids together. Um, when Tina didn't come home, you know, that night, early the next morning, it wasn't incredibly unusual because sometimes Tina would, you know, go hang out with people. So he didn't think much of it. But after like a day or so, he's like, okay, something was obviously wrong. Tina's missing. And so he reaches out to Vicky, you know, Tina's very good friend, and Vicky tells him about the phone conversation. Because Vicky just assumed that Tina had gotten home. So at that point, Vicky finds out uh, Tom Keeter's phone number. She finds out through someone and calls him and says, hey, where, where's Tina? 
Uh, she said she was with you. And Tom was like, I don't know what you're talking about. Vicky said, well, I found out that the only Tom that Tina ever worked with was you, Tom Keeter. And he said, uh, I don't know if that's true or not, but I didn't see her, I didn't talk to her, I haven't spoken to her recently. But, you know, when Vicky relays this information to the boyfriend, Patrick, Patrick gets Tom and he and Tom go to Vicky's place and talk to her. Vicky then again says exactly what the phone conversation was. Tom, who was there, was becoming very defensive towards Vicky. Like, I, I don't know, I did not pick her up that night. It wasn't me, so I don't know why you're saying it was me. But after a, a longer conversation, Tom would finally admit, well, you know what? I was the only Tom that I'm aware of that ever worked with Tina at the molding company. But as Patrick uh, was trying to like get some more information out of Vicky, uh, Vicky would say that Tom was just staring daggers at her. Like, I'm, you know, like very scary, like I, you better shut the hell up now kind of thing. Patrick turns to Tom and says, Tom, just be honest with me, man. Are you sleeping with Tina? Is that what's going on here? And Tom's like, no, I'm, you know, I'm married, I have kids which never, never doesn't mean anything. Well, Patrick would later tell police that what was interesting about that, that interaction was that if, you know, Patrick knew Tom and he said that anytime you would accuse Tom of doing something that he didn't do, Tom would get very defensive, but like physically, he would be screaming at you. He would almost fight you. But in this instance, all of this was going on. Tom was like verbally a little defensive, but he really kind of backed down. He didn't fight back or anything. And so Patrick just thought that was extremely strange. That was very unlike Tom. So at that point, Patrick and Tom go to the Rapid City Police and report Tina missing. They go to the molding company where Tina worked, where she was last known to be, and they find her car there. And as a matter of fact, her car did have a flat tire. It was more than obvious though that this was not a normal flat tire. She didn't run over something and it went flat. There was a very obvious slash in the tire. So they knew that somebody had deliberately stabbed or poked or something a hole through her tire with some sort of sharp instrument. So that was a deliberate act. Which would then lead police to believe that, okay, this had to have been foul play. Whatever happened to Tina, someone did something to her. Someone slashed her tire for the purpose of her, you know, not being able to go anywhere. And maybe this good Samaritan offered her a ride home and then did something to her. Which goes back to Tom. So Tom is brought in to the police station. They interview him and he says, I had nothing to do with whatever may have happened to her. I did not pick her up, that wasn't me. He says, give me a lie detector test, I'll pass it, easy. I don't know if they did or not ever give him one. He tells police he had an alibi. He was playing a softball game that night and around 11 p.m. he would end up after the game, he would take a friend home. He then says as he's driving home, his car breaks down in front of the super duper market and it conveniently, I guess, uh, broke down underneath a street lamp. And he said he spent the next two to three hours fixing the issue that caused his car to stop operating. The thing is, is police interviewed everyone from that area um, and not one single person can say they saw any vehicle stop there in that area that night. Doesn't mean it didn't happen because it was late at night. So a lot of people were probably sleeping, but there were some people who would tell police that they were definitely up, uh, you know, that night. They you or were night people, right? And they didn't notice anything. Tom would also normally call his wife Nancy to say, "Hey, I'm running late uh, when I'm, you know, on his way home." But he never called Nancy that night. He never said anything about to her about why he came home so late because he didn't come home until like 3 or 3.30 in the morning. Well, according to Nancy, um, Tom almost immediately came home and began washing his clothes because he said he had grease and stuff from fixing the car, plus also the softball game. And then he also washed his shoes and his shoelaces, which when police found that out, they were like, what the, f who does that? When interviewing his coworkers and friends, a lot of people would tell police that Tom had a darker side to him. He could be very combative. He could be very violent at times. He had a criminal record. He had been uh, involved with armed robberies and assaults before. Given the facts that it's widely believed that Tom Keeter was the one to pick up Tina that night, and the fact that Tina has never been seen again, making Tom Keeter the last person to ever see her, they believed that he was the one and only suspect in her disappearance. And so they go to the lumber yard where he works and they confront him and say, listen, we're pretty much considering you the main suspect or only suspect in this case. And they blatantly asked him, are you having an affair with Tina? Is that what's happening here? 
and he just said no. They also apparently found uh, blood, what they thought was blood, in Tom's car. I'm going to tell you right now, I don't know if they've ever released the results of the blood found in the car. Because I think Tom and Nancy would both say, oh, that's just Kool-Aid. Okay, but but I don't know. I don't know the results of if they found out if it was blood or not, and if it was whose blood it was. I don't know. The day after police questioned him and grilled him um, on Tina's disappearance at the lumber yard, the next day, Tom was dead. He was found underneath the forklift with his head crushed. So in the days after his death, OSHA would end up fining the uh, lumber yard about two thousand dollars, somewhere around two thousand dollars or so for safety infractions. OSHA would later state that in their investigation that if this was an accident, like if Tom was for some reason lying face down on the ground, the forklift would have been moving so slowly that he would have had so much time to get up and move away from it. So that really only left two conclusions. One, he did it to himself, or two, someone did it to him, he was murdered. But the timing of it with the fact that he was now being told that he was the suspect and whatever happened to Tina, we found blood in your car. And also they were able to get the shoes and shoelaces that he tried to wash and they still found a couple of droplets of blood on it. So with all this confrontation, all of this stuff, the next day he's dead. And that made police believe that he did this to himself and he made it look like an accident so that his wife and kids would get money. Well, because of all the investigations going on, his wife and kids didn't get money from the get-go. It actually took years and years for them to finally get it. And that's because the investigators with OSHA, with the police, they couldn't actually prove it was uh, something he did to himself. And so that's why eventually the family got the, the insurance payout because it was really kind of only considered an accident at that point, or maybe even a murder. Him doing it to himself, like I said towards the beginning, I mean, that is one hell of a way to do it. To sit there and just watch this forklift with all this lumber sacked on it just slowly approach you and you do nothing and it just runs you over. I mean, that is, that's got to be awful. No, like who would do that to themselves? I mean, if he wanted to do it, there's probably other ways he could have done something that made it look like an accident, maybe like a fall from somewhere. But that is so extreme. But it's also not out of the realm of possibility. I mean, could have done it. There would be a psychiatrist involved who kind of looked into all of this and they said that in the days leading up to his death, there was absolutely no signs of depression, no signs of despair. He gave no types of indications that he would ever do this to himself, but also he was a suspect in a disappearance and possible murder. They don't even really know what happened to Tina. And so I don't know why they didn't look at, put that into their psychological profile of he could have done this to himself. But that's a big reason why he would have done it to himself. He is a suspect in a, in a possible murder and he wanted his family to get money so it had to look like an accident. If it was murder, who did it to him? Why? He didn't, I mean, they didn't really, couldn't find any suspects as to who would deliberately do this to him. It would have been someone he probably worked with, but they found no evidence that anyone did this to him or they couldn't find any motive as to why someone would do this to him. His wife, Nancy, does believe that he was murdered. She has stuck by him this entire time. She believes that he had nothing to do with what happened to Tina, whatever that may be. And she believes that somebody killed her husband, that there was no way he would have done this to himself. There's no way he would have left her and the kids. But again, if you are a suspect in a disappearance and possible murder, that changes your entire mental state, especially if you are guilty. If you did something, that's going to, you might be prompted to do the worst possible thing to make yourself not get caught. And that could be ending your own life. So police believe what happened was that Tom went to Tina's place of work. He slashed her tires in order to make it so that she couldn't get home and she couldn't leave. He then goes away, comes back a little bit later when she's off because he would know her schedule because they were acquaintances. They talked from time to time and he pulled up and that's when, you know, Tina was on the phone, came out and he offered her a ride. He probably tried to make sexual advances towards her. She said no, and therefore he did something to her. He killed her and then put her, hit her wherever. The thing that police think that Tom did not account for was the fact that Tina was on the phone. He probably wasn't planning for that uh, because that's how he's, his name came into this altogether was because Tina told Vicky, Tom is here, Tom that I used to work with. 
if that didn't occur, if they did not have that tiny piece of information, he may never have been brought up as a suspect whatsoever. He may have gotten away with whatever he may have done. That's really what it hinged on because there was no evidence that would have led them to Tom at all. So he definitely was not, that was not in his plan. His wife, Nancy, would later state that Tom told her that somebody is trying to frame him for murdering Tina. And that's why he may have done this thing, or that's maybe why somebody killed him. The person who really killed Tina, if she is in fact dead, also killed Tom to make him look like a guilty party. That he did this to himself to escape you know, uh, prosecution. And it sounds like some people were trying to accuse uh, her boyfriend, Tina's boyfriend, Patrick, but there was no evidence to suggest he had anything to do with this. And Tina would have said Patrick on the phone, not Tom. On October 11th, 1995, at the lumber yard where Tom worked, there were some workers who noticed this big pile of wood and scrap wood, and they were trying to take some pieces off when they noticed a foul odor and then they noticed human body parts. They took more lumber off and they revealed that there was in fact a human body in this pile of wood on the lumber yard where Tom Keeter worked. The body would soon be identified as Tina Marcotte. She had been murdered, she had been, her body had been hid, and it was all on the place where Tom worked. Tina had been killed by blunt force trauma. The police believe that she was definitely killed somewhere else and then just dumped there. And if that's the case, wow, what are the odds of being dumped on the one place that Tom Keeter worked? Many years down the road, and I think it was one of Tina's children as an adult would later tell people, the blood found on Tom Keeter's shoes and shoelaces, in fact, was a 99% match to Tina Marcotte. So her blood is on his shoes, her body is on the property where he works. His, he dies after being considered a suspect. They were onto him, then he dies, mysteriously. It all adds up, one plus one equals two. And so according to uh, Tina's family member, because the blood was determined to be 99% match to Tina, that both cases, the case of Tina Marcotte and Tom Keeter, are now both considered closed cases. And they, the daughter would state that police have stated to them that if Tom was still alive at that point, Tom would have been arrested and charged with the murder of, T of Tina Marcotte. Nancy, however, uh, you know, Tom's wife still claims he is innocent, that his death was a murder, that these are two separate things, that Tom did not kill Tina. I mean, <sighs> Can I absolutely sit here and say that he killed her? No. But if her blood was on his shoe, a shoe he tried to clean, even according to Nancy, that's a little suspicious. And then her body being found on the property where he worked, that's odd. But you know, Nancy said, well, it's all a setup. He wanted, they wanted to frame him for her murder. It's, it, Vicky, the person that spoke to Tina on the phone that night, I don't even think she really knew Tom. Um, and so the fact that she would say, that Tina said, Tom is here, I'm getting a ride with him, Tom that I used to work with. I mean, that's, what else do you need? That's the only Tom she had ever worked with at that particular place. And, you know, his, his whereabouts are pretty much unknown from 11 p.m. until about 3.30 a.m. that night, which all fits in the time frame because this happened to Tina at about 12 30 a.m they knew each other they were acquaintances they had worked together everything adds up if this was presented to a jury could i say for sure that they would have found him guilty i don't know i don't know if there would have been um, enough physical evidence to suggest he was the one to kill her a lot of circumstantial evidence does the biggest physical evidence is the blood on his shoe but 99 percent. i mean nowadays i don't know if they've retested it but nowadays you can get a really accurate like yep that's definitely her blood so i don't know if it's been retested or not and so really this is all kind of just left up to interpretation assumptions circumstantial stuff it sounds like tom keeter is a responsible party that he is the one who did this but we'll never know for absolute certainty because tom is dead he died himself in a really brutal way and i would think to myself that nobody would ever do that to themselves, but it's not out of the realm of complete possibility. It could definitely happen. 
it did happen. So in the end, Tina Marcotte was found. She was brought home to be laid to rest properly by her family. They now know where she is. They now know pretty much what happened. It's just a matter of, do they really know for sure if it was Tom? It sounds like based on some comments I read from Tina's family, her daughter, it sounds like her and the family have some peace that they truly believe that Tom was her killer and that this is over. Tina Marcotte may not have gotten uh, justice in terms of the court system, in terms of a guy being found guilty and thrown into a prison cell for the rest of his life, but she did get a more uh, grim form of justice. And justice in any way, shape, or form is still justice. And so Tina got that justice that she rightfully deserved. But that is it for this case, True Crime, Aruni, Dooney, Dingleberry Dongs. I hope you found it interesting. As usual, if you're new here, hello, my name is Mike. I tell true crime stories here, obviously. So please subscribe, give the video a like. Also, I tell shorter form true crime stories over on TikTok. The link to my TikTok is in the link tree, which is in the description of this video below. In that link tree, you will also find my case list. It's public, you can scroll through it. It's alphabetical for the most part. If there's a case you want me to cover, first check the list, see if it's on there or not. Or you can just send me a really quick email, which is also listed below. Um, just send me the name of the case, where it happened and when it happened. I'll add it to my list. The list is like around 6,500 names long. I pick the cases each time at random. I can't promise you it'll cover that case, but I will get to it eventually. But that is it for this one, True Crime Aroonies. So until the next case, ta-ta for now.